Happy New Year from all of us at the Agency for Public Information. We wish you a very healthy and prosperous 2016. Good evening and welcome to the API program, the first for the year 2016, produced, presented and aired Tuesdays and Thursdays by the Agency for Public Information. We keep you up to date with all the latest developments in government policies and projects. Coming up on this evening's program, Prime Minister Dr. Ralph Gonsalves addresses the nation in a national address to mark the beginning of the year. Two Vincentian under-19 cricketers are all set to travel to Bangladesh as part of the West Indies under-19 cricket squad. The youngsters were recipients of a quantity of cricket gas donated by the government of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. And the Ministry of Tourism, Sports and Culture awards winners of the just-concluded National Nine Mornings festivities. The details to these stories when we return. But first, here is News Watch with Kisha Woodley. Good evening and Happy New Year. Welcome to News Watch. I am Keisha Woodley. As the new year unfolds, export of agricultural produce has begun to regional markets. Agricultural produce is assessed at the Gee Shed for export to regional markets, including Trinidad and Tobago and Barbados. Produce includes coconut, dashing, and plantains. On Monday, January 5th, Minister of Agriculture, Honorable Sabota Caesar, visited the Gee Shed to get a first-hand view of the produce being exported and to interact with traffickers. A trafficker and long-standing farmer for over 30 years, Monica Ross, expressed gratitude to the Ministry of Agriculture for their support. And I thank the support program to helping us because this morning we have, I have at least 15 pallets of banana to start the new year with and I'm asking the farmers to continue with the production and most of all give us the quality. If we haven't have a standard, we haven't have a quality. We need quality products in the region. So therefore they will make money and we will make money. And they also have to be productive. Let us get the proper goods in order so that we can able to go forward and look for new markets and make money. We don't have to depend on England. The regions can carry the banana but we must have a proper standard and I thank the Minister Soboto Caesar who behind me a hundred percent and make sure that we get product to go to Trinidad and sell and come back and sometimes they give us a leeway that we pay when we come back and that is a good incentive on the far on the Ministry of Agriculture that they're able to send out a helping hand we thank the support farmers who look over us and help us in our situation. Right now, the volumes are building back up and we thank the farmers to plant, produce, take care of the bananas so we can get it to go and sell and come back. Another trafficker, Rhonda Sutherland, said that traffickers with Barbadian currency face several challenges when converting it at local banks. We have a problem with our um, Bajan currency. Thing. When we go out, carrying out the load to Barbados and come back to St. Vincent, we cannot get the money changed. Only $500 allowed to change. You have to go by each bank and change 555 for pay the farmers them. Sometimes the farmers them is vexed when we ain't get the money for pay them in time. And I think that is my problem right now, the foreign the exchange of the money. As it regards to the, the farmers, I understand that you and the farmers have a good relationship. What are some of the produce that you buy and sell overseas? Okay, mangoes, plantain, dashin, edos, everything Barbados too. And have you been getting good qualities over the years? Yes, please, because we have to wash our load and everything. We like trying to have to push anything. We have to make sure the load clean. Plant quarantine officer Augustus John highlighted some issues with agricultural produce brought to be assessed for export. Now there's a trade that goes on internally and externally. Barbies and Trinidad 
and Barbados do has a protocol where that, whereby since the advent of the pink mealybug in 2001, Barbados Authority had um, designed a protocol to assist exporters to able to sell or bring their goods to Barbados. But there are certain protocols and rules that they have to follow. Example, you have to have a qualified pong um, box for planting and bananas. Coconuts should be 60 or uh, so in a sack. The produce should be well washed, clean, inspected, free from soil and um, any kind of pest or debris. This should also be in um, those situ sacks, those onion sacks, whereby the inspector could simply just look at it and able to identify the commodity that's in the, in the sack. Now, with respect to um, bananas going to Barbados and Trinidad, they have this trade going, and our role also is to inspect mainly bananas for the pink mealybug. Uh, as you know, Trinidad has zero tolerance for the pink mealybug. So if a consignment should go down there with any pink mealybug and the fruit or anywhere, they will confiscate or uh, send it back to the, to the country of origin. Now, um, with respect to Trinidad, we see where they have done well for the past, but there need to be an improvement. We we'll see where they have um, overpacking the boxes, telescoping boxes where they have at least sometimes up to 150 pounds in one box. Now, when you take commodities to the marketplace in that condition, most of the time they jog around, they can hardly be lifted properly, and they got a lot of scarring and so on. And basically unpleasant for the, for the buyer to buy. It's not really attractive. So our role now is to see how we could um, organize, especially train that, to get them get the packaging properly in terms of like a um, 45, 45 pound in, in a box and ensure that they are properly inspected so that they could fetch a better price and the consumer will be able to demand more of that commodity. Minister of Agriculture, Honorable Sabota Caesar, wished the farmers of St. Vincent and the Grenadines and all stakeholders in the agriculture sector a blessed new year. He said, we continue to work very hard in this sector to build St. Vincent and the Grenadines. I am here where we are witnessing the purchasing and many transactions being done of agriculture produce. I note that this week we are purchasing through the farmers support company some 40 pallets of bananas. And this is as a result of the injection by the farmers support company. Over the last two years, many banana farmers have gone back into production. We have a current demand of over 250,000 banana plants. And uh, it is really overwhelming and encouraging when you see young persons coming into the Ministry of Agriculture and particularly the Banana Services Unit, noting that they are going into cultivation some up to five, six acres of bananas at a time. We export our bananas mainly to Trinidad and Tobago and Barbados, and it fetches a price of approximately $26 per box. This also is very encouraging. We have sent out a trial shipment to the United Kingdom, and we are going to send out two more trial shipments in the first quarter of 2016. We have several problems that we are facing in terms of our trade with some of the, the islands and as a ministry we are going to work to address these problems. One of the major issues that we are going to address in the first quarter of 2016 is the packaging particularly to the Trinidad and Tobago market. When we fail to package our goods properly and follow the requisite protocols, our goods do not arrive at the market in good quality and the traffickers will receive less. This reduced price is passed on to farmers and because of that, many farmers cannot obtain the production costs that they would have put in. 
So this is something that we are going to look at both from the Trinidad and Tobago end and also from St. Vincent and the Grenadines. We are going to work with packers, traffickers, farmers, all the stakeholders in the industry to ensure that we send a better product. We produce excellent goods, agriculture, commodities here in St. Vincent and the Grenadines and we are not going to sell ourselves short in 2016 by the poor packaging that we see going into some markets. I am aware that the Farmers Support Company is going to send the delegation up to the British Virgin Islands before the end of January because we are looking for new markets for produce. Also, with the coming on stream of the Argyle International Airport, we'll be able to export a significant number of produce to the United States of America. And we already have many farmers and traders who are already looking into these markets. Thank you for viewing Newswatch. A blessed and healthy new year to all of our viewers. Good evening. I am Keisha Woodley. Applications are invited from suitably qualified persons who wish to be considered for temporary positions under the Support for Education and Training SET program, commencing 2016. Application forms and brochures are available at the following locations. The Office of the Prime Minister, 4th Floor Administrative Centre, Kingstown, Service Commissions Department, 2nd Floor Ministerial Building, Kingstown, online at www.pmoffice.gov.vc and www.psc.gov.vc. Completed applications should be submitted to the Cabinet Secretary, Office of the Prime Minister, 4th Floor, Administrative Centre, Kingstown, or the Chief Personnel Officer, Service Commissions Department, 2nd Floor, Ministerial Building, Kingstown, and should be submitted along with the following. A certified copy of birth certificate, certified copy of qualifications, two recent testimonials, curriculum vitae, recent police record, and a picture of applicant. Only successful applicants will be contacted. The deadline for a receipt of applications is 31st January 2016. Morning boss, how much for this pants? What happened the price the day what happened here, Cassie? What kind of customer service is this, Joe? Good morning, may I help you? Can you tell me how much that bag costs? Certainly, just a moment. Remember, tourists and locals should be treated equally. This is a message from the Ministry of Tourism. Tourism today. Tourism tomorrow. If you've just joined us, you're viewing a presentation of the Agency for Public Information. Prime Minister Dr. Ralph E. Gonzales, in a national address at the start of the year, has called on every Vincentian to embrace new and better attitudes towards life, noting that we all have a role to play in this country's development. Here's more in the Prime Minister's first national address for the new year. Fellow Vincentians and residents, I greet you at the start of the new year 2016 with love, faith, and hopefulness amidst the challenges of life, living, work, and production. The opening days of a new year always prompt reflections as individuals, families, and for our society as a whole. Invariably, we consider in one seamless process our past, particularly our immediate past, our present, and our future. We thank Almighty God for his abundant blessings, especially the gift of life. And we reflect on our strengths and possibilities, our weaknesses and limitations. And we pledge to do better, to be the best we can as individuals, as families, as communities, and as a society, as a nation. We realize that ahead of us are challenges 
some known and some not yet known. But we resolve to meet successfully whatever challenges with God's grace and in communion with each other. So for the year 2016, I urge that we adopt a positive attitude to our lives and living, that we discard negativism and any sense of hopelessness or helplessness. We have a lot that is going good for us, and a better harvest is ahead, but we must embrace new and better attitudes to life, living, work, and production. Each of us has a positive role to play. In the aftermath of the general elections, there has been for some an unsettling and disturbing period. For me, and indeed for the overwhelming majority of the people of St. Vincent and the Grenadines, the elections are over. The Unity Labour Party has won. And we must get on, all of us, with our lives and with the efforts of building better lives for ourselves and a better country. In respect of those for whom dissatisfaction is their permanent lot and disruption their permanent tactic, I urge them to reconsider their part of folly and join the rest of us in meaningful nation building. I assure everyone, though, that a recalcitrant minority will never be able to divert a determined people and their government from the path of peace, orderliness, progress, and prosperity. More specifically, no one will be permitted to trample upon law and order under the guise of an infantile and holy and popular political protest of absolutely no merit. Before the end of January 2016, our government will present and secure passage of the estimates of revenue and expenditure for the year 2016. Sometime thereafter, within the prescribed legal time frame, the appropriation bill, otherwise known as the annual budget, will be passed by the parliament. The estimates and appropriation bill will be grounded in prudence and enterprise. It is necessary and desirable that we be prudent in our spending, manage efficaciously our fiscal deficit and public debt, secure further financial stability, ensure economic growth through public and private enterprise, enhance wealth and prosperity, create more jobs, reduce poverty and hunger, strengthen the social safety net for the vulnerable, stimulate sustainable development overall, and further improve public administration and good governance. Centrally, therefore, in 2016, we must direct our efforts primarily to growing the economy and ensuring the creation of more jobs for the people. During the recent general elections campaign, I emphasized all these matters and more for our, our agenda up to 2020 and beyond. Specifically, I highlighted a number of initiatives, including the completion of the Argyle International Airport and the startup of its operations, the delivery of geothermal energy for the generation of electricity by the end of 2018, the completion and operation of the modern medical complex at Georgetown, and the two polyclinics at Mespo and Bookamend, respectively, the completion of the renovative works at the Milton Cato Memorial Hospital and the Mental Health Center, the rolling out in the second half of 2016, a comprehensive road repair and rehabilitation program on secondary roads and feeder roads, the further elaboration of plans to build a modern city at Annasville, including the modern acute referral hospital and the modern cruise ship pier, the push for the building of a modern port in the area of Bottom Tongue in Kingstown, the cleaning up and upgrading of the city of Kingstown, the rolling out of significant private investment, local and foreign, in tourism development, including at Pittison Vincent, Palm Island, Union Island, Myro, Canoan, Beckway, and Mount Twin Peters Hope, and the rolling out of further private sector investment, local and foreign, 
in manufacturing, agriculture, fisheries, the four medical schools, financial services, and housing construction. Meanwhile, a bundle of sensible public policies which touch and concern the upliftment of the people will continue apace in diverse areas such as education, health and wellness, sports and culture, cultural industries, climate change and the public health environment, telecommunications, water and electricity, poverty reduction and the push to zero hunger, women and men at risk, the elderly and the children, the youths, and persons resident in isolated geographic areas. Achievements in all these public policies rest on the foundation of the maintenance of law and order and a well-functioning independent judicial system. So a lot of work is ahead of us. Every person has an important contribution to make. I encourage workers, supervisors, and managers in the public sector and in private businesses to work together for the good of the enterprises and for themselves. Too often, some workers treat their employers as persons against whom hostilities and anti-business activities, including sabotage, are to be waged. Some workers, albeit a minority, are deliberately unproductive and lazy. We must speak the truth on these matters. We must also say truthfully that too often also some managers or owners of enterprises treat workers disrespectfully and with disdain. We cannot properly develop our enterprises and our nation with these terrible managerial or worker attitudes at our places of work. In the year 2016, we all must redouble our efforts to engender better and more productive attitudes to work and management. We should promote the enhancement in attitudes to work and production as a national crusade. This is something which radio and television should promote. Customers and persons whom we serve in the public and private sectors pay the bills. Employees and employers must never forget this and improve the quality of our service delivery. Rudeness, laziness, and don't care attitudes must be avoided. Let us try to do much better in these respects and others in 2016. It does not take much effort for us to improve. We just have to want to improve in these areas. Our workplaces should not be war zones. We must make every effort to make our workplaces enjoyable, safe, and more productive. In 2016, we must do better on the roads. There's too much careless and reckless driving. Everybody knows that. Everybody is commenting on it. The motor vehicle is fast becoming a dangerous weapon. In 2015, 25 persons died in road accidents and dozens more suffered injuries, in some cases serious injuries. Surely all of this is unacceptable. It is true that the police must better enforce the traffic laws, but drivers of motor vehicles have an overriding obligation to drive with due consideration for other road users. In 2016, our government will embark upon a focused national conversation on this matter with a view to implementing appropriate changes. We must be very serious on this issue. It has become one of life and death. Similarly, our government intends to build upon its existing efforts to stamp out violent crime, including gun crimes, and theft of farmers' produce and animals. Further appropriate measures will shortly be announced. Hardworking farmers deserve more protection from the ravages of these unconscionable persons who want to reap that which they do not sow, and homeowners must feel safer from burglars. I come now to a sore point for the government and those diligent citizens and residents who pay their taxes. It is this. Too many of the taxpayers, including large and medium-sized taxpayers, simply do not pay 
their taxes as required under the law. Some $200 million are owed in arrears of taxes, taxes of all categories, plus the interest and penalties. Some big businesses, including a few with significant cross-border trading, do not pay all of their due taxes. Own account businesses, including professionals, are notorious in not paying their fair share of taxes. In all of this too, it is to be noted that the compliance rate for VAT is falling. A significant number of property owners, including in certain geographical areas, are not paying their property taxes. And many owners of motor vehicles are not paying their motor vehicle licenses. These are also driving their vehicles uninsured. I am publicly urging the offending citizens and residents to make satisfactory arrangements with the tax authorities, to pay up their arrears in taxes and to keep current with their tax obligations. I'm also demanding of the tax authorities to administer the tax laws with fairness and firmness. It is simply unfair that some persons get away with not paying their due taxes while others have to carry the tax burden. Further, the government cannot properly execute its necessary and desirable programs if taxes are not being paid by so many persons. A similar complaint is being made about employers who do not pay over to the national insurance services, their own NIS contributions, and those which they have deducted from their employers' salaries, their employees' salaries or wages. The NIS ought to get tough on such recalcitrant employers. There are enough challenges and difficulties facing our small country for us to be making our lives more problematic with unproductive labor and management, mayhem on the roads, violent crimes, burglaries, theft of farmers' commodities, and non-payment of due taxes and NIS contributions. The challenges from the global economy, the fallout from the international terrorism, and destructive disasters are adding to the existing limitations of a small island developing country with its scarcity of material resources and its abundant vulnerabilities. These external challenges we must meet successfully. But we make things more difficult for ourselves when we pile on internally induced problems which we can easily avoid. But we have it within ourselves to leverage our strengths and possibilities, including our bountiful seascape and landscape, and our people's resilience and creativity to do better. So let us be grateful for our blessings and work in concert with each other to uplift our lives, living and production. Let us renew our quest to improve our conditions of life and living in these challenging times. With faith, hope, love and productive labor, we will succeed. In this mighty venture, government at all levels must lift its game markedly so too must our citizens and residents. Each of us must daily pose this query. Ask not what St. Vincent and the Grenadines can do for you. Ask what you can do for St. Vincent and the Grenadines. And having asked that question, then do something productive and positive for ourselves, for yourself individually, and for our country. On behalf of the government of St. Vincent and the Grenadines, and on my own behalf, I wish everyone a successful, productive, and uplifting New Year 2016. Thank you. Applications are invited from suitably qualified persons who wish to be considered for temporary positions under the Support for Education and Training SET program, commencing 2016. Application forms and brochures are available at the following locations. The Office of the Prime Minister, 4th Floor Administrative Centre, Kingstown, Service Commissions Department, 2nd Floor Ministerial Building, Kingstown, online at www.pmoffice.gov.vc 
and to www.psc.gov.vc. Completed application should be submitted to the Cabinet Secretary, Office of the Prime Minister, Fourth Floor, Administrative Centre, Kingstown, or the Chief Personnel Officer, Service Commission's Department, Second Floor, Ministerial Building, Kingstown, and should be submitted along with the following. A certified copy of birth certificate, certified copy of qualifications, two recent testimonials, curriculum vitae, recent police record, and a picture of applicant. Only successful applicants will be contacted. The deadline for a receipt of applications is 31st January 2016. I love the land of my birth. The coolness of the morning breeze and the clear blue sky that covers me. I love the lush green mountains and the rivers that run so free. I love the warm smells of the people and the golden sunsets over the Caribbean Sea. I love most of all to welcome visitors to the land of my birth, to share and enjoy its beauty. Together let's make Thank you for staying with us. Two of this country's most outstanding and promising junior cricketers will travel today to join the squad of the West Indies Under-19 team en route to the ICC Under-19 Cricket World Cup scheduled to take place in Bangladesh from January 27 to February 14. Deputy Prime Minister the Honorable Sir Louis Straker along with the Minister of Tourism, Sports and Culture the Honorable Cecil Mackey and other cricket officials were on hand at the Arnesville playing field on Monday where they presented the players with new cricketing gear. Here's more from the API's Charlotte John. Vincentians Gideon Pope and Obed McCoy are named among a group of outstanding young cricketers from across the region who will represent the West Indies as they vie for the 2016 ICC Under-19 World Cup Championship taking place in Bangladesh from January 27th to February 14th. The Vincentians join two other counterparts from the Spice Isle Grenada in the first time that the Windward Islands have jointly contributed four players to the West Indies Under-19 team. Deputy Prime Minister the Honorable Sir Louis Straker, flanked by the Honorable Cecil Mackey, Minister of Tourism, Sports and Culture, and other representatives from the St. Vincent and the Grenadines Cricket Association, presented the players with a number of professional cricketing gear to further assist in the advancement of their careers. When we have young men of this caliber going abroad to represent our country, we should be very happy. From what I have gathered, they are God-fearing, well-disciplined, well-focused young men who have excelled so far in the field of sports and they would be representing the West Indies in the International Cricket Council. They, have, they leave uh, here tomorrow and they leave from Barbados to England to India through England and then to Bangladesh where they'll be playing and representing the West Indies. I pray that they would continue to hone in their skill, that this would not be the beginning of what we are seeing in their career in cricket. It would not be the end of it, but it would be just the mere beginning as they move on to greater heights and uh, be able to make us all feel proud. We hope that they would perform well and that they would be a credit to us here in St. Vincent and bring glory to the cricket world here uh, back home. President of the St. Vincent and the Grenadines Cricket Association, Kesha Oshalo, made a financial contribution to the players on behalf of his organization. It's indeed a pleasure from the association to have these youngsters um, excelling at the youth level. Um, 
Gate Runners, you know, for years has been dominating youth cricket, West Indies youth cricket from the under 15 to the under, 19, under 17 and now the under 19 level and I expect him to, to go further. This is just another stepping stone moving to the senior team in probably a year or two, I hope. Same for Obed who has bossed in the scene for the last two years and instantly created an impact and we expect again great things from him. So for in a year when we plan to revolutionize cricket in St. Vincent again, it's just indeed a, a great way to start, you know. Um, going forward, I'm hoping to have these two youngsters um, photos and a couple of billboards around the country, which I'm hoping would, would inspire other youngsters to get involved in cricket. And that is the direction that we're hoping to move towards over the next few months, in line with our strategic plan, of course. Minister of Sports, the Honourable Cecil Mackey, offered the cricketers a word of encouragement on the eve of their departure to join the West Indies under-19 team en route to Bangladesh. It's a pleasure for us to be here this afternoon with this presentation that has been initiated by Sir Louis Straker to these two young cricketers that would have done their family, their communities and St. Vincent and the Grenadines proud. And of course, you just heard from the president of the Cricket Association, they are also beaming from air to air. It is always good when we have young people rising to the top. And uh, this afternoon, we are paying tribute to two young cricketers drawn from two different sides of the island, uh, Mr. McCoy from the leeward side and uh, Mr. Pope from the windward side of the country, and it is an indication that the cricketing talent is indeed spread throughout St. Vincent and the Grenadines. These two young men have made it to the under-19 level, representing not only St. Vincent and the Grenadines, but the entire Caribbean. And I'm confident that they will go out there and do well for themselves and for the country, because I'm sure that their ultimate goal is to make it to the senior West Indies cricket team. A number of years ago, the government of St. Vincent and the Grenadines indicated that sports will be central to the development of our nation and of our people. And as such, we indicated that as far as possible, national players, male and female, across all of the sporting disciplines, that we will work along with um, these sportsmen and sportswomen to ensure that they get all of the necessary support. That they are placed, first of all, um, in terms of employment, and therefore they can sustain themselves um, to as great a degree as possible. But that we'll also have incentive programs that would allow them to obtain the necessary gear across the sporting disciplines so that they could use those to further hone their talents and their skills. We've also spent millions of dollars at the plane facilities throughout the length and breadth of St. Vincent and the Grenadines, hard courts and the plane fields. And in this way, we are saying um, to the young men and women that we are interested in your development and the only how you can reach to that pinnacle is by having the necessary um, facilities available. These two young men would have taken up the challenge and the opportunity and they are now at the level, the under-19 level, at the highest in the, the, the West Indies. But we must continue to support them. And the presentations that are being made today will be an indication that we will be there for them now and in the future as they progress in terms of West Indies representation. There's nothing that can replace hard work, commitment and dedication. And I'm sure that these two young men understand those principles very well. And I'm sure that they will keep it in the forefront as they go forward in their cricketing careers. Their selection to the West Indies team more or less brings a climax to an extremely successful sporting year in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. I think unparalleled in our sporting history, the year 2015. And one of the things that we are going to do is to highlight these achievements as we go forward in preparation for our National Sports Awards. I've already said to the National Sports Council that we want to take the National Sports Awards to an even higher level that we can recognize young and outstanding talent like we have here today. 
So this is something that we can look forward as we continue to promote sports as a pillar for development of our nation. Once again, congratulations to the young cricketers, to the association, to the communities that help to develop and nurture them, um, to the parents of both of them who played their role, and of course to the media who helped in sending the message out that we have young outstanding talent here in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Congratulations to you both. Congratulations to Sir Louis um, for coming up with this initiative of support for these young cricketers. And may we stand ready to support other young sportsmen and sportswomen as they move forward with their own individual achievements and for that of their association. In our next story, participants of the just concluding nine mornings festivities received their prizes at the prize giving ceremony held last Saturday at the Peace Memorial Hall. Officials of the Nine Mornings Committee promise that this year's unique Vincentian Festival will be even better. Here's more in this report from Sheridan Lewis. The prize-giving ceremony of the recently concluded Nine Mornings Festival was held on Saturday, January 2nd at the Peace Memorial Hall. The festival, which ran from December 16th to the 24th, was held under the theme celebrating a unique Vincentian tradition. Organized by the SVG Nine Mornings Committee, the festival extends to other community-based competitions. The winners of these competitions were also awarded their prizes. The Venlec Community Lighting Competition in Zone 1 winner went to Rosebank, second place Trumaka, third Peter Bodell, and fourth Leyu. In Zone 2, the top spot went to Green Hill, second Fountain, and third Town Hill. In Zone 3, Cotton Ground took the first position, while Career had to settle for second place, and the third and fourth positions went to the Richland Park and Simon Villages, respectively. Point Village caught the top spot for Zone 4, second position, New Grounds, and third, Owea. In Zone 5, Port Elizabeth took the first position, while the Diamond Village took the second spot and Clifton Union Island third. The overall national winner was Point Village, second place Rose Bank and Cotton Ground third. The best lit garden went to the Richmond Hill Gardens and second Fitzhugh's School Grounds. Giving a review of the Nine Mornings Festival, Deputy Chairman of the Nine Mornings Committee, Lennox Bowman, noted that despite the late start, the festival was a memorable one and expressed much anticipation for this year's Nine Mornings Festival. I can safely say that the people of St. Vincent and the Grenadines enjoyed Nine Mornings 2015. Yes, we had a, a late start, and there may be one or two activities, especially those activities prior to Nine Mornings, which, much, which would have been a bit subdued. However, Michael just said it. This year, I'm proud of not just what happened on the mainland, but certainly what happened in Bekwe, Union Island, and Kanawan in terms of the Nine Mornings. And I am seeing what I'm seeing happening now is that come 2016, when we all should be very comforted by the fact that the airport should be opened. Would be, would be. I said would be. Yeah, would be. Yeah, then we can look forward to a really bumper year, bumper 2016 Christmas. Reflecting further on the Christmas season and the nine mornings, Bowman acknowledged the goals that were established and stressed that these goals have set the tone for nine mornings today. When the committee started its work in 1999, we had set for ourselves some objectives. These objectives among them were, we wanted to make sure that so the nine mornings is celebrated in every substantive population center in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. What has happened so far? We've been able to achieve that. Some years ago, we had up to in excess of 50. This year, we are down to 22. But the quality of these concerts continue to improve, 
and the quality, not only in terms of the programming, but in the technical aspects, continue to, to, to improve. We wanted to promote an environment where we, ex we, we exposed all forms of our traditional music, dance, and so on, and put, promote our traditional cultural values and inspire national pride. I think it is clear without a doubt that we have been able to reinforce, especially in our youth, that Nine Mornings as a unique Vincentian tradition and as a unique festival is alive and well. My one regret right now is in the business places. And I said before on radio, and I will say again, we create, we do the work. When I say we, I'm not just talking about the National Nine Mornings Committee. But I'm talking about everybody sitting here and the work you do voluntarily in your community. You do the marketing and the advertising and creating the spirit of Christmas. And the least that we can ask our, commute, our businesses to do is to reciprocate. Because they're the ones who benefit most from, from this activity. And I, you know, and I'm not saying, as Michael will tell you later, there are, a lot of, there are quite a few businesses who support us and support us very well, and we are very thankful, and without them, we may not even have a festival. But I'm talking about the creation of the spirit. I'm talking about businesses in town putting up two strings of light, as, as, as Michael will say, every year. You know? Bowman further disclosed some other challenges faced in making the Nine Mornings Festival a success. When it comes to Nine Mornings, In spite of the hard work that we do in the communities, and no praise is enough for the, the, the committees in the communities, in spite of the hard work we do, we recognize every day that we are fighting an uphill battle to one, not just keep Christ in Christmas, but secondly, to keep the spirit of Christmas alive and well in the midst of the Grenadines. There still is not enough done, in my opinion, by enough programming done by the radio stations and the other media to promote Christmas. I really feel, and it, as soon as Christmas finish, <laughs> with the exception of one or literally two radio stations, you, you, stop hear, you stop hearing any kind of carols, any kind of Christmas music. You know, it's, it's, it's crazy. There are 12 days of Christmas starting on Christmas morning. So we have to be a little bit more conscious of these things. One of the objectives we had to is to make sure that we educate our, our, our people and, and our, our youth. And with, this, this is something that we have set about to do. And we, with your help and those children attending, we, we, we're going to get there. And the final thing I want to say is about our documentation. Michael is doing what he can now in terms of the Ministry of, of Culture in terms of documenting what we have here. Nothing that we are doing now is going to mean anything if it is not documented. Chairman of the Nine Mornings Festival Committee, Michael Peters, pointed out what a true Nine Mornings experience is all about and emphasized the significance of the support of the private sector. You have those who want to see a fete every morning because one of the traditions of Nine Mornings is early morning fete. There are those who want to see a street jump up because one of the traditions of Nine Mornings is street parade. And of course, um, the religious community would like to see increased um, Christian activities in the festival. So the festival has been pulled on all sides. But we are confident that we are maintaining what the festival is all about, the mix that brings the whole family together. And there was another interesting observation I made this year that tells me what Nine Mornings really is about. A lot of people, you have visitors and friends come in, and I know I looked at the Ecuadorians and the team from Impact World, and obviously their friends and hosts would have told them, you're going nine mornings, you're gonna have to go on stage. So they came prepared. And when we said visitors, I didn't know we had so many Ecuadorians spending Christmas here. A lot of them came on stage and they sang and they danced. And the same thing with the folks from Impact World, they came prepared. Because that is what Nine Mornings is about, the audience involvement. And the fact that visitors can be involved, not from a distance, but actually go on stage. 
It is that experience which sells the festival and makes it so unique and attractive. Which is why when Lennox made the call for all sectors to be fully involved, it is critically important. Because if we promote St. Vincent and the Grenadines as the place to be for Christmas, it's not only the activities, but it has to also have the look. And this year, Kingston certainly did not have the look of a Christmas capital. And we're still continually making that appeal to the business community to help. And all we say is two string of lights on your building would make a huge difference. Meanwhile, Minister of Tourism, Sports and Culture, the Honorable Cecil Mackey, said the Nine Mornings Festival has assisted with discovering a new pool of talent in the country. He said that despite challenges, over 20 communities and individuals participated in this year's festivities. Mackey noted that the way forward is crucial to the development of the festival. 2016 no doubt will be a bumper year for nine mornings in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. We virtually did, well, we had in mind doing a test run this year because we had said that at the prize giving last year. But as fate would have it, I think we would have been challenged to have that test run. But we also know that we saw 12 or dozen or so aircrafts landing at the Argyle International Airport. A number of persons came home for Christmas this year. Yeah. We are waiting on the numbers, but I suspect that once again Michael will put up his hand and say, yeah, yeah. top festival in the year without a doubt, Christmas. Because we would have seen 10, 15,000 persons coming home for December each year. And it, would, it takes a combined June and July ah. to beat those numbers for Carnival. So Michael will say, we have it, we have it going. Right. Yes. So we continue to say Christmas and Carnival, the two premier festivals. They have done well for the country. Yeah. But what is going to happen in 2016, and you heard it from the persons coming home for Christmas this year. In fact, some persons came home for Christmas First time for 30-something years, 40-something years. They've come for carnival already and other times in the year, but the first time they're coming for Christmas, and they would have had a wonderful experience. I expect that we can probably almost double those numbers for December 2016. I said almost, I mean, we can argue whether we'll double it, whether we will increase by 10, 15, 50%, but for sure, we'd have more persons coming home for December 2016. So we have an excellent opportunity beginning now. And I'm going to put some pressure on the organizing committee to provide the necessary report on activities 2015. And I'm sure that they can provide that by the end. They probably have it ready already. I might find it on my desk on Monday. Um, but I'm sure that they'll have that completed before the end of January. I don't know if the chairman would want to start getting some quick suggestions this morning. We can probably get quickly some of them, but that's up to the chairman. But Lennox also suggested, and I also commented that the fact that we all have confidence in the organizing committee. So when they've done the report for 2015, I suspect they would also have recommendations for 2016, because the point must be made that it would not be only up to them we are going to be depending on you, all of the communities, to put forward very special programs for 2016. So you have to be involved. The culture minister highlighted the historic lighting of the botanical gardens and suggested that concerts can be held in that vicinity. He also urged the media to be more supportive of the Nine Mornings Festival by assisting with its promotions. The best Nine Mornings community went to the village of Stubbs, 2nd Barley, 3rd Leu and 4th Carrere. The best Christmas community was awarded to Port Elizabeth Beckway, 2nd Carrere, 3rd Leu and 4th place went to the Richland Park community. Meanwhile, the most popular local Christmas song went to Roland Rowley Bowman with Everything for Christmas. Second, Armstrong Strong Williams with Round the Corner. Third, Caldrick Forbes with It Must Be Christmas. And New Star with Season of Love rounding up the fourth spot.
Reporting for the API, I am Sheridan Lewis. We have come to the end of another presentation from the Agency for Public Information. Thank you so much for joining us. You can do so again this Thursday evening at 8 o'clock. On behalf of the entire production team, I am Dion John wishing you a pleasant evening and a wonderful work week.